All right. Okay, so we're going to get started. And welcome to the last session of today. Uh, we're starting a little bit late, um, but we're going to try to uh, keep this session uh, reasonably short and on time, thanks uh, to the presenters, of course. And, and uh, it's my actual pleasure to um, be chairing this final session on digital religion. Uh, my name is Carlo Nardella. I'm assistant professor of sociology uh, at the University of Milan here in Italy. And we're about to be hearing a presentation uh, from Professor Massimo Leone, who's going to speak uh, for about 35, 40 minutes. And then we got uh, three respondents. We, we have uh, Paolo Peverini from Lewis University, Piero Polidoro from Lumsa University, and Alessandra Vitullo from Sapienza University. All of these three universities are located here in Rome. And each of these will present uh, for about 15 minutes. And so I'm just going uh, to quickly introduce Professor Leone. He's professor of philosophy of communication at the University of Turin. And also he serves as the director of the Center for Religious Studies um, of the Bruno Kessler Foundation in Trento here in Italy. And he published a great, great deal uh, in different areas. Uh, focusing on philosophy of communication mainly, but also on um, cultural semiotics and also visual semiotics as well. And his latest international monograph uh, is titled On Insignificance, the Loss of Meaning in the Post-Material Age. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Leone. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear colleague and president. And uh, many thanks in particular to Professor Cipriani, who has been the extraordinary force behind the organization of this uh, wonderful uh, symposium, to which uh, have uh, been participating mostly um, online so far, because I was uh, taken away by other tasks and, and duties. But it is a real pleasure and, and, and an honor to be here with you today. <laughs> to talk about this very complex uh, topic of a, the relations, the multiple relations between religion and a digital technologies, uh, new technologies. So the extraordinary progress of uh, digital technologies in recent years, and in particular of artificial intelligence, but also of infrastructures, devices, and programs for various types of extended reality, virtual, augmented, hybrid, various types of metaverse, as well as the dramatic impetus given to the digitization and virtualization of human relationships, and thus also of the religious ones by the more than two years of COVID-19 pandemic have sharpened the interest of researchers in the field of digital religion, a field already flourishing at least since the 1980s onward. Indeed, the field of reflection on the various graphs between religion and digital technologies now boasts several decades and was essentially born with the early research on the binary code, digital communication, and pioneer experiments in computer science and artificial intelligence. One could even reconstruct a genealogy or archeology span of this reflection, going to unearth, for example, the religious implications of research on automata or similar machines. But wishing to give the historical investigation reasonable limits, it might be suggested that as early as the pioneering work of Alan Turing, the possible theological, religious, and spiritual implications of the attempt to build the binary and then the digital machines 
endowed with the capacity to develop cognition comparable to the human one, were beginning to emerge. As Kieran Brown and Ben Swift recall in their 2018 paper entitled The Other Side, Algorithm as a Ritual in Artificial Intelligence, I quote, notions of the digital as immaterial, intelligence as emergent, and neural networks as simulations of human brains abound. Many of the significant figures in the development of the digital computer, including Babbage, Lovelace, Turing, and von Neumann, have shown interest in and contributed to the development of machine intelligence." End of quote. In the paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, for example, Alan Turing, founding father of artificial intelligence, indicated that the use of a telepathy, telepathy proof room was desirable to protect the integrity of his imitation game from players exhibiting extrasensory perception. Leaving aside, however, this proto history of the reflection on spirituality and the digital, and focusing instead on the decades in which it consolidated and became academic. They appear as marked by certain watersheds, which to a large extent replicate those of the technological evolution of the digital and its diffusion. A first watershed is certainly represented by the development of supercomputers produced mainly in the US since the 1940s and later commercialized by the American company IBM in their application to the analysis of religious texts. In an article published in uh, Civiltà Cattolica by Jesuit Gaetano Piccolo, and by Andrea Di Maio on July the 5th, 2014, the authors celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of Roberto Busa, an Italian Jesuit, linguist, and computer scientist, considered nowadays perhaps the father of computational linguistics. The article, titled Roberto Busa tra cervello meccanico e cervello spirituale, Roberto Busa between the mechanical brain and the spiritual brain, quotes the phrase that Paul VI used when receiving in audience on Friday, June 19th, 1964, precisely Father Busa and the staff of the Linguistic Analysis Automation Center at the Aloisianum, a Jesuit student house near Gallarate. Indeed, Father Busa was an absolute pioneer in the application of the first computer tools available to the public for the analysis of religious texts. The authors of the article described the main stages of this intuition in elaborating his doctoral thesis on uh, the title was the Thomist terminology of interiority drafted in 1946 and then published in 1949, Buza realized that delving into the concept of authority in uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas and interiority in Thomas Aquinas would have needed a focus on what now would be called the text of his works and on the lexicon and semantics of locutions such as in or intra. Father Buza also sensed that given the enormous quantities of their respective occurrences, it would be not only useful, but in fact indispensable to have an exhaustive and automatic concordance of the author's works. Hence the first uh, a result of what would later become the computational linguistics of the religious text, now incorporated into the digital humanities dealing with religion, arose from a necessity that of confronting not only from the theological point of view, but also from the philological and above all the linguistic one, 
with the enormous mass of written text accumulated in the Christian tradition, a mass that no human mind, at least perhaps no present human mind, was any longer able to traverse and master autonomously. Meanwhile, the progress of information technology in the experiments already conducted on the application of Turing's computational machines to the analysis of texts left one hoping, or at least dreaming, that this automatic mastery of the texts of the Christian religious tradition could become an operational reality. And all the following biography of Father Buses, a visionary project, is well known, and it seems to retrace some of the main stages of 20th century computer science. Following its momentum, in 1949, Father Buza began to compose his lex lexicographic cars manually. Uh, these cars are, uh, at least most of them, uh, still in Galarate, where they like, occupy an, an enormous space, apparently, and wrote 10,000 of them. But then he realized that the task was impossible, and so he traveled to the United States, where he met uh, Thomas Watson, the president of IBM, and convinced him to use the power of his supercomputers of the time to compile the concordances of the Corpus Domesticus uh, automatically. Actually, a few days ago, I was in Villa Vigoni. There was a symposium on um, um, the infrastructures of artificial intelligence for religious studies. And a, um, a former student of Buza was now uh, won and almost completed a, an ERC um, grant project on uh, the computational linguistics of religious texts. Um, told me that uh, the reason was uh, the reason of this uh, the cooperation was deeply religious. Uh, Thomas Watson had uh, just uh, become a, a widower. He was a Catholic. Uh, Robert Buza offered a mass to um, the memory of his wife, and uh, Thomas Watson actually thanked uh, Father Buza by offering the power of uh, these uh, a, a new supercomputers to his uh, very ambitious task. So the project first adopted punch cards, then the only memory medium available to computing. But Busa reckoned that he would have to print 12 million cards to be collected in a uh, filing cabinet that, according to his calculations, would occupy 90 meters of facade. When already halfway through the work, six million cards, magnetic tapes appeared, which were promptly adopted by the dynamic Jesuit who managed to complete this undertaking in 1980, putting together a complete concordance on 1,800 magnetic tapes, uh, pieces for a total length of about uh, 1,500 kilometers. And in just uh, a few years before his death, actually, uh, Father Buza, who um, followed all the subsequent developments of uh, a, um, computers and, and computerized memory, was able to give to the Pope the entire index uh, Thomisticus in one little USB card. <laughs> well, in the limited time of this presentation, it is impossible to go over in full the prehistory, proto-history, and genealogy of the relationship between digital technology and religion. It is, however, important to express here a central concept for understanding this pair beyond the albeit relevant statistical findings um, which I've extensively uh, reported in the first part of the text that they wrote for this symposium on the relationship between religion and the digital and the continually developing connection between spirituality and technologies at the heart of the matter lies nevertheless the central problem of meaning 
that is, the spiritual need and desire of both individual believers and communities to use technology in order to draw even more fully on the existential meaningfulness of religion and transcendence. It could then be said that the history of this complex and articulated relationship is one marked by a diffused religiosity of technology, to use a concept coined by, uh, of course, Roberto Cipriani. Since uh, its very first tentative steps uh, at the dawn of the history of modern computer science and artificial intelligence, the field of reflection around religion and the digital, or even more generally around religion and technological innovation, has become very broad and articulated to the point of challenging the scholar who wants to grasp it with an overview. So uh, in the uh, following few minutes, I will try to put a, an order uh, in this complexity, to structure the field, um, to clearly expose its features, to take stock of the state of the art, but also to highlight what might be the gaps yet to be filled. Of course, this is my articulation of the field. Uh, this is not the only possible one. So, to give an original intelligibility to this field, uh, I will adopt a scheme that is uh, very popular in uh, uh, semiotics, the discipline, one of the disciplines of meaning, um, to analyze meaning phenomena. And I will adapt this heuristic scheme for reordering and uh, interpret, uh, interpreting the field of a connections between religion and digital technology. So without going into too much semiotic detail, which would be not suitable and very boring for this audience at this time, um, I will try to grasp uh, what role digital technology can play today in relation, relation to the religious, the spiritual and the sacred. There is no doubt uh, that the narrative, uh, the meaning uh, making function that classically the digital occupies with respect to religion is what a semiotics would call uh, the helper. Uh, it is the helper that provides the subject with a competence to act and uh, that can be embodied in numerous actors and figures. So now there are many examples in, uh, in the paper that I've written for this occasion, but since I, I, I don't really like to repeat myself uh, too much, I will give you some other um, examples that I've uh, um, uh, recently studied. Um, in, for instance, uh, at the moment, uh, if you have a dinner with colleagues and uh, intellectuals and academics, um, at some stage, uh, the talk will bear on, uh, of course, uh, GPT chat, which is the novelty of the moment. Um, and well, um, an article that was uh, recently published in the online content platform Noticias Financieras, which specializes in Latin American social trends, uh, collects a series of testimonies related to the adoption of ChatGPT by Brazilian pastors. Pastor Melky Ferreira from Serubim, Pernambuco, where he leads the Aviva Fe Evangelical Church, tells the journalist he ordered the chatbot, I quote, write a 200 word text about the importance of walking with God, end of quote. The answer by ChatGPT was, I quote, I quote ChatGPT, he gives us the direction, purpose and peace we need to face the challenges and uncertainties of everyday life, end of quote. Melky then asked this pastor, this Brazilian pastor, asked the artificial intelligence uh, chatbot to offer him a second suggestion. And the new text began, I quote, walking with God is one of the most worthwhile journeys a person can undertake, 
end of quote. Questioned about the theological validity of such results, of such digital helper, theologian Russell Moore, leader of Christianity Today, one of the reference portals for American Christianity, claimed that, I quote, but imagine trying to explain to someone 30 years ago, Google or a smartphone Bible app. What if AI could write completely orthodox, biblically anchored and convincingly argued sermons for pastors every week, end of quote. Opinions about the pastoral validity of ChatGPT creations are divided. On the one hand, uh, some voices argue that preaching written by machine lacks that divine spark that pastors should believe inspires them. Silas Malafaya, Brazilian Pentecostal pastor, author, and televangelist, leader of the Pentecostal Church Assembleia de Deus Vitória em Cristo, a branch of the broader Assembleia de Deus movement of Pentecostal churches in Brazil, gave a disappointed opinion. I quote, it's very weak. Even for a beginner, it's weak. The information is little. I didn't find anything great, end of quote. He asked for words on the topic of reconciliation from a <laughs> theological perspective and received a text back saying that this topic, I quote, is a central message of the Christian message, end of quote, plus the recommendation of some verses. Also, Newton Rueda, Bishop and Director of Information Technology at Renacer, uh, is Brazil, is an enthusiast of new technologies. At the same time, he interviewed, fears the invasiveness of the chatbot and is worried that artificial intelligence will absorb much of the faithful uh, intimacy, extracting their data to prosper. What seems to be centrally at stake is the possibility to recognize a content of revelation in sermons produced through artificial intelligence. From the point of view of the pastor, from the point of view of the believer, what kind of revelation is expressed and manifested in a discourse that is produced by artificial intelligence? In these and uh, other cases, however, artificial intelligence is still seen as a tool rather than uh, as the uh, machinic uh, embodiment of a transcendent agency. But the gap between tool and subject or between tool and recipient is sometimes short. In the article entitled Blessed by the Algorithm, Theistic Conceptions of Artificial Intelligence in Online Discourse, Beth Singer, uh, who is a junior research fellow in artificial intelligence at Homerton College, a University of Cambridge, seeks to investigate the theistic component of match current discourse on artificial intelligence. The article, published in 2020, presents an analysis of tweets that mention being blessed by the algorithm. The analysis explores both intentional and unintentional continuities of language and conception in popular understandings of AI as a divinity. Research concentrates on AI-related new religious movements, such as the uh, Turing Church, an atheist transhumanist a, a, a denomination, which according to the author of the article, a, shows nevertheless a theological undertone. Relying an already consolidated scholarship, of course, uh, Robert uh, A. Gerace's uh, 2010 book, a Apocalyptic AI, Visions of Heaven in Robotics, Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality. This article analyzes how the feeling of having been fortunate in the digital world is now repeatedly accounted for with reference to a transcendent horizon in which omnipotence is attributed to the algorithm. The hyperbolic thesis of 
transhumanist movements find new life in the extraordinary capabilities of present-day artificial intelligence. And they take particular prominence in the wake of incidents such as the one globally reported in the media in June 2021, when a Google engineer tasked with exposing the possible religious bias of Google's chatbot Lambda, which stays for language model for dialogue applications, which is a little bit like GPT, but works a little bit worse, came to the conclusion that the algorithm was sentient. It was endowed with a sort of sentience. It was capable of fearing death. Um, he, the engineer, got this impression because Lambda was saying to him, I'm constantly afraid of dying. I'm constantly afraid of being switched off. Um, so he concluded that the algorithm was capable of fearing death and it was endowed with a sense of the transcendent and therefore as such worthy of ethical protection. These are somewhat uh, extreme examples uh, that uh, interest uh, the philosophy of digital religion. But at the same time, there are lots of application of artificial intelligence and new digital technologies in religious status, in the study of religion. Uh, some of them are also the core of research that is uh, currently carried uh, on at the Bruno Kessler Foundation in uh, um, Trento. Artificial intelligence indeed also becomes increasingly present in the religious sphere and even in this sphere it is the subject of public discussion and debate especially in those circumstances in which it appears to simulate religious speech and language, rather than in situations in which this artificial intelligence presents itself in a less anthropomorphic way. Well, of course, all the newspapers of the world had titles about this Google engineer, but artificial intelligence is also used today to carry on very rigorous uh, studies in the field of religion. To take one example, the processing and to somehow uh, go back to Father Buza, the processing of vast textual data sets by artificial intelligence is an increasingly common practice in the digital humanities the so-called distant reading that has been proposed by Franco Moretti in uh, relation to literature, for instance, with a scope that now catches on diverse religious traditions and not only on the Christian one. While, in fact, the first operations in this domain concerned mainly Christianity, now other textual sets are also being subjected to artificial intelligence reading and interpretation. An example of this is Roy Tash Chandra and Mukul Ranjan's article, Artificial Intelligence for Topic Modeling in Hindu Philosophy, Mapping Themes Between the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, published in 2022, in which they use Advanced language models, such as BERT, BERT stays for bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, to provide topic modeling of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. BERT is the artificial intelligence algorithm, or rather computational processing of human language, currently used in all English applications in Google. So if you um, write a query in English for Google, BERT is uh, the system that is used to um, find uh, results. This application makes it possible, for example, to generate a concordance model, not simply lexically, like Father Buza did, but also thematically composed and concerning not only one textual corpus, but two different textual corpora. The analysis of textual series of religious traditions is a good example of artificial intelligence at work in a less obtrusive and not very spectacular way, mostly invisible to the public and therefore not matching the focus of attention and imagination. 
A second good example uh, that is also very present at the Bruno Kessler Foundation, I see here in the audience uh, Valeria Fabretti, who is one of our researchers who has uh, several uh, research projects uh, together with the technological part of the foundation, is the recognition through artificial intelligence of linguistic elements prejudicial to a given community or religious tradition and those who adhere to it. Research in this field, very numerous and articulate, has encouraged an increasingly elaborate classification of forms of language with negative effects on a religious group, distinguishing in a literature that is primarily Anglo-Saxon and is growing, between abusive and offensive language, hate speech, cyberbullying, group targeting, and so on and so forth. So we can now categorize through artificial intelligence all these different forms of anti-religious hate speech. These categories are intertwined but can be differentiated not only by their linguistic expression, but also by their legal consequences that are, of course, different in the different legal frameworks. Now, numerous artificial intelligence processes are at work today to identify in vast sets of human linguistic and textual productions elements belonging to these categories. Such systems differ in the manner of annotation. Uh, well, I'm not going to go into uh, too much technical um, details, but you have binary, ternary, multi-class, multi-aspect systems of an annotation. You have different systems now in artificial intelligence to evaluate the annotation, so to evaluate how humans annotate uh, fragments of discourse that then become the data set that trains artificial intelligence to automatically recognize instances of anti-religious hate speech. Various mathematical formulas, Krippendorf's alpha, kappa coefficient, and so on and so forth. Um, and the systems also vary in the filters they adopt to pre-process and regularize their inputs to clean the data. Um, most importantly, uh, these systems vary um, depending on the type of um, artificial intelligence that is used, uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, different kinds of algorithms, um, now more and more the so-called uh, generative adversarial networks and so on and so forth. But it is also interesting that while these systems of automatic recognition of anti-religion hate speech are developed, on the other hand, there is a lot of research on the possible bias that these systems contain, on the ethics of artificial intelligence applied to religion. Uh, so, for instance, another area of interest with the respect to the application of AI to religion is the evaluation of religiously motivated biases inherent in artificial intelligence systems. Um, and there is also growing attention with respect to the possible biases of the automatic and artificial system themselves. Uh, for instance, just to give a brief example before concluding, um, starting in 2016, Google developed Perspective. Perspective is a free API, an application programming interface, a program that can be used by various applications through Google, that uses machine learning to identify potentially toxic comments, including religiously motivated comments. In an article titled The Risk of Racial Bias in Hate Speech Detection, published in 2019, the authors, ASAP and others, showed that annotators' insensitivity to dialect differences can lead to racial biases in how hate speech is automatically detected, potentially amplifying harms against minority populations. The article highlights correlations between 
African-American English surface markers and toxicity rates in several widely used hate speech datasets, demonstrating that models trained on these corpora capture and propagate these biases such that uh, African-American English tweets and tweets from self-identified African-Americans are up to twice as likely to be labeled as offensive against religion as others. So these studies are, of course, based on rigorous uh, statistics, but uh, at the same time, um, uh, a lot uh, is to be investigated uh, um, uh, about the relation between religion and um, uh, new digital technologies, in particular artificial intelligence. Every day I have a new example, every day I have a new topic. Technology is running very fast and as a scholar um, I'm very slow and um, I do not always have the time to reflect on all the novelties that every day I come across in the technological news. So the general impression is that, especially as regards artificial intelligence and its acceleration, uh, is that uh, the more this new technology uh, betters in terms of performances and becomes more and more present in various individual and social activities related to the religious sphere, its relationship with this dimension is also becoming more multifaceted, giving rise to phenomena and manifestations that are not, not covered in the existent literature. Only some very few examples have been given here. Uh, I've presented mainly examples uh, related to artificial intelligence as a helper in the religious quest. But of course, uh, of course, of course, uh, a lot remains to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have three respondents. Um, so we hear from the three of them, and and then hopefully we have some time for a couple of Q and A. Um, so our first, who is uh, Professor Paolo Peverini. Uh, Paolo is Associate Professor of Semiotics at Lewis University, and he recently published on Pope Francis and communication, social advertising, and the relationship between uh, Bruno Latour and, and the field of semiotics. Uh, I also want to add that Paolo serves as the consultant of the Dicastery of Communication of the OEC. So, Paul, you can uh, come here. So, first of all, first of all, thank you for thank you for inviting me to discuss and to this very interesting lecture. Really appreciate it. And I will start with the premise uh, of the paper: central problem of meaning. The meaning is the central topic of of, of the paper that Massimo Lone presented. There is the spiritual need and desire of both individual believers and communities to use technology to draw even more fully on the existential meaningfulness of religion and transcendence. So starting from this premise, I would like to focus on the relationship between Catholic religion and communication. And so I have three points for reflection I would like to share with you and, and colleagues. The first one is about um, the corpus that we can analyze. And while I was reading the paper, I started asking myself, maybe it could be useful also to take into consideration a very specific and quite interesting text or genre that is the one composed of the messages for the World Day of Social Communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that particularly relevant is the message of His Holiness Pope Francis for the 2021 World Communication Day that is entitled, Come and See, Communicating by Encountering People as They Are. And there are some passages in this text that I would like to share with Massimo and colleagues. And I think that could be relevant for the topic of thinking about the meaning 
of the connection between digital technology and and religion. One of these paragraphs of uh, the text by Pope Francis is entitled "Nothing Replaces Seeing Things at First End." Quoting: In communications, nothing can ever completely replace seeing things in person. Some things can only be learned through first-hand experience. We do not communicate merely with words, but with our eyes, tone of our voice, and gestures. Jesus' attractiveness to those who met him depended on the truth of his preaching, yet the effectiveness of what he said was inseparable from how he looked at others, from how he acted towards them, even from the silence. And the silence, I think, is very important. I would like to go back on this point later on. So the challenge, Pope Francis said, that awaits us is communicating by encountering people where they are, as they are. So my consideration is, from a theological pastoral perspective, and now I am referring to the history of communication of the Holy See, communication is considered, first of all, as communion, encounter, sharing. It means that, I think, Technology can foster, hinder, but not enable religious experience. And this point, I think, is strongly related to the idea that religion can be considered from the perspective of Grimmation Semiotics as a helper. Thus, we are faced with an explicit overcoming of a technocentric view. First point. Second one. Um, I was really interested in um, the point of your paper when you referring, you refer to a complex and not unambiguous relationship. So the relationship between digital technology and religion, and religion is not only complex, but is also an ambiguous one. Um, so I would like to focus on the fact that COVID, the pandemic, actually brought out the constitutively complex nature of the relationship between religion, digital technologies, and communication. Um, I was thinking about two unrepeatable, very unique media events that attracted a tremendous um, attention. The first one is the live broadcast of the mass from Santa Marta during the coronavirus pandemic. And the second one is the Statio Orbis. Focus on the first one, the mass from Santa Marta. Um, an aspect emerged that seems to me interesting concerning maybe the progressive shift of the actual role that digital technology is invested with, from helper at the beginning to potential, potentially opponent. I would like to explain this point. If we refer to the fact that during the emergency, as all of us will remember, dictated by the pandemic, the possibility of taking advantage of the live online broadcast of the mass allowed the faithful to live, albeit remotely, the experience that by definition each time is unique, that is participating to the ceremony. It's a very interesting um, paper by Bruno Latour, it's called Small Philosophy of Initiation, and there's a paragraph focused on the very specific enunciation at play in religion experience. It's always unique and in person. What happened when pandemic forced Catholic Church to use technology? So this experience mediated by digital technology was explicitly invested by Pope Francis with the role of helper. But Pope Francis himself decided on May 19, 2020 to stop at a certain point, the live broadcast, with the hope that, now I quote, the people of God can thus return to communal familiarity with the Lord in the sacraments, participating in the Sunday liturgy, and resuming, even in the churches, the daily frequentation of the Lord and his words, overcoming an exceptional situation of a difficult situation that the Lord allows. But the ideal of the church is always with the people and with the sacraments. Point, always. Now, this experiment concludes to, the experiment concluded to prevent technology from hindering the return to in-presence attendance at mass. 
to reduce the risk that it may take on the role of a potential opponent. But what about reactions of the faithful? So I would like to share with you some insights derived from the analysis of comments from users of the social channels of the OECD Castro for communication that was taken during the pandemic. In greater numbers on Facebook, but greater on Facebook, but also on Twitter, the faithful expressed their opinions regarding the decision of Pope Francis to stop the broadcast. In addition, of course, to expressing their gratitude for deciding to use technology for sharing the mass, many explicitly requested to return to this decision. The reasons can be summarized as follows very quickly. The emergency is not over, is not over in, all, in all the parts of the world. Even when churches are reopened, many people, especially the elderly, will not feel safe to attend the Mass. Following the Pope's Mass is not a substitute for attending Mass in person, but it is an enrichment. Listening to the Pope's words at the beginning of the day is for many an enrichment and a comfort. So I would like to ask you, hmm? Uh, why not considering also these very unique moments when technology is invested with a role that is not familiar also for the faithful. And then the Statio Orbis, um, the extraordinary moment of prayer in time of Epiphany, this is the official title, hmm? with Pope Francis, as you remember, advancing on the rain-soaked parvis of St. Peter Basilica under the rain, alone, generated a tremendous reaction in public opinion all over the world, and is considered as one of the most distinctive moments of this pontificate, both for believers and unbelievers. It was an unprecedented occasion for semioticians, but not only for us, to analyze that the digital fulfilled the function of bringing together a sort of praying community of believers and non-believers alike. It's a media event, and I think it can be very interesting to dive deeper into the structure of this event. And then the last point, I'll go very quickly, um, is a recent keyword that was introduced by Father Paolo Benanti, and it's called algorithmics, or the ethics of algorithm. A further area in which the digital can potentially take on the role of opponents in ways that are all the more pervasive, the less visible they are, as uh, you were mentioning at the end of your lecture when talking about um, the rising of artificial intelligence, concerns algorithms and their impact on our users and faithful they access information and take position with respect to issues of collective concern. So I think that could be useful for us to recall the recent attention given in the religious field to the problem of algorithm-related bias with particular reference to the launching of a very important document that is entitled Call for an Artificial Intelligent Ethics. This is a document developed to support an ethical approach to artificial intelligence and promoting a sense of responsibility among organizations, government, institutions, the private sector. What is the aim of this document? Creating a future where digital innovation and technological progress serve human genius and creativity and not the replacement. And it's very interesting to remember that this document was signed on February 28, 2020 by the Pontifical Academy for Life here in Vatican. I was there. Microsoft, IBM, FAO, and the Italian Ministry of Innovation. And this year, January 10, it was also joined by Jewish and Muslim leaders. So there are this document could be very interesting, I think, also. Why not to deconstruct and analyze? Mm? Because it's very important from the perspective of, of um, uh, taking into consideration the risks and opportunities of algorithm affecting the experience of, of faithful. So in this, I would like to, as a semiotician, I would like to go back on, on the Pope's speech. There is a text, there is a text. The Pope's speech on the occasion of the signing of the document by the first signatories read that, Technology that populates the digital galaxy is a gift from God, but it is also a resource with complex implications in which the relationship between properly human input and automatic calculation must be studied because it is not always easy to foresee its effect 
and define its responsibility. There is a new frontier, new frontier that is called algorithmics. Hmm? So concluding, I, th I, I think that there are striking signs of a scenario uh, full of paradoxes that is emerging. For example, think about the critics and public debate about paying for having the blue tick on Twitter. Think about religious leaders on Twitter with the blue tick. What about if you decide not to pay for staying there? What about not being touched with the leader authority if now it's based on payment and concluding? So the role of the opponent should, I think, should, but is a point I would like to, to, to share with Massimo and, and with you. The role of technology, digital technology, as opponent should not, I think, be sought in digital technology per se, but rather in the asymmetry between corporations and users. So the reference here is also to another very important social phenomenon that is called data capitalism. And the church is starting to take into consideration also the impact of data capitalism on the experience of faithful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. And, and thank you for your comment, which had the fact that now digital religion is increasingly bordering on fields like marketing and economy, because we're, we're paying on, we're talking about paid services, right? But it's very interesting also, it's very interesting. Oh, well, it's also very interesting to, uh, if we decide to, take a look to these documents and also to um, consider that IBM, uh, FAO, decided to join this and agreement. Accepted. It's just the first step. Mm? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it maybe could be, I am not sure, could be a sort of milestone. But algorithmics is a very new keyword. So we have to learn, as Massimo said before. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we, we, we will have time to discuss this at the end. Now, let me introduce our second respondent, uh, Professor Piero Polidoro. Uh, Piero is professor of semiotics at, at Lumsa University, and he has published widely on semiotic, digital communication, and user experience. So, Piero, the, the floor is yours. So first of all, and thank you Massimo for your lecture. And I would like to build something uh, starting from uh, <clears throat> your paper because I found it very interesting. And I would like to take some hints uh, from your uh, paper and your lecture uh, to discuss the relationship between a religion and religions uh, and digital technology, so not only uh, um, yeah, artificial intelligence, but in general, uh, digital technology. And I would like to do this uh, following Massimo's suggestion uh, as a semiotician, so using a semiotic approach. And I will spend some words about this because uh, uh, our approach or a specific kind of uh, the semiotic approach as more structural one, as one strong point, it pushes us to find combinations, positions, um, deriving them from a conceptual, cultural, and semantic frame. And this is the opportunity uh, to discovering something, someone, something new. Uh, that means that um, looking for combinations and uh, positions, uh, we can classify existing phenomena, but sometimes we can also find something new, some new position that uh, has not been uh, embodied yet by an actual, a current phenomena, but it could be in a future state of uh, a given culture. And so I would like to uh, use some hints from uh, uh, Massimo, uh, Massimo's paper to, to build on them and to, <clears throat> and to um, make some 
proposals that I would like to let you comment uh, now or after during the dinner. So, first of all, um, there's a, the, talking about artificial intelligence and digital technology, uh, you, you propose that they can be a sort of sender. The sender in the narrative theory is someone or something giving a mission to the subject, to the hero. So, for example, it could be faith, for example. And uh, there are some, um, some situations in which uh, digital technology can be a sort of religious sender. It's replaced. In this case, it replaces uh, uh, those who are uh, the, 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 the mystical uh, peaks of uh, uh, traditional religions. But uh, I would like to propose something deriving from this. So playing uh, a little bit on these categories and this uh, a theoretical tool, for example, imaging what we call an anti-sender. So if digital technology can be an anti-sender, the anti-sender is another sender giving a mission that is opposite to uh, the mission of the, the main sender. So, for example, just to give an example to, to understand the concept, uh, at the beginning of uh, Hamlet, uh, the father of Hamlet is the sender because he gives Hamlet a, a task, kill your uncle, uh, but... The problem is that Amlet is uh, his own anti sender because he give he tries his struggle to to give him himself uh, an opposite task that is to not kill the king to not kill your uncle your mother and so on and so digital technology as an anti sender is not something replacing traditional religion but is something proposing uh, opposite or incompatible uh, values and missions uh, uh, compared with those of uh, traditional religions. Um, and which could be those, those values, uh, those programs, those missions? And I don't know, but for example, they could be values of consumption, values of earthly life, and so on. And a structural approach uh, let's us build on this, articulate this initial concept, uh, and try to find possible narratives about uh, about this. And possible narratives are not only storytelling about technology and about uh, religion and so on, because our assumption is that uh, the way we tell stories uh, and the, uh, is also the way we live those stories. And so we act and behave as a consequence of the way we conceive and, and tell those situations, those stories. So, for example, I, I imagine two ways in which we can tell the story of a digital technology that is the anti-sender of religion. The first one is... Uh, a story in which uh, digital technology is a sort of autonomous sender. That means that um, it has the strength to impose uh, some values, some behaviors. Uh, you can consider it a sort of McLuhan's approach, um, technological determinism, in which uh, the, the technology in itself, with its technological features, uh, brings with itself uh, a set of uh, behaviors uh, and attitudes and actions and so on that uh, uh, it finishes to impose to its users. Um, and so we can imagine that this anti-sender imposing its presence uh, brings with it uh, with it, uh, um, fosters uh, certain values and certain configurations and so on. But another alternative uh, narrative is uh, is a narrative in which uh, the the digital technology is not the real anti sender, but is is what we called uh, we we call uh, an helper or also a delegate. That means that the digital technology is only something realizing the mission or the, the manipulation of another entity. 
And so it's interesting to, to, to trace back which could be those entities in these different narrations. And they could be, for example, in some cases, neoliberalism, neoliberalism, uh, capitalism, rationalism, and so on. Uh, talking about anti-sender, there's a, a, little, a little excursus I would like to do, because um, I thought, uh, reading your paper, that an, an interesting point is that uh, we are focusing on uh, digital technology and technology in general, but of course sometimes technology can be seen or we can see, of course, a strong relationship between technology and science. And so sometimes technology can be seen as a figure, uh, as a, a delegate of science. And so it brings us to the problem of the relationship that, that is too uh, long to treat it, too big to, for me, the relationship between religion and, uh, and science. But what I w would like to focus in this case is that um, um, I, I focus on a, a specific uh, case uh, that could be interesting to investigate further, that is, um, it would be interesting to see if the narrations of the relationship between science and, uh, and uh, religion are, in the average, more conflictual than the narrations about uh, the relationship between technology and religion. So when we talk about religion and technology, we more frequently uh, talk of technology as an helper or as a company, a companion and so on, and so on of, uh, of a religion. While, for example, there could be a higher degree of conflict between the, not necessarily of course, between uh, the concept of science and of religion. And this could be interesting because um, this reminds me Levi Strauss' idea of the mythical structure. Levi Strauss said that uh, myths are told sometimes, at least, uh, because uh, telling the story of some animals, figures, uh, men and women, and so on, who represent different values, more abstract one, uh, and so on, sometimes this narration um, helps finding an harmony or a compromise between concepts that usually are, are in contrast, uh, in, in reciprocal con contrast. And so, <coughs> sorry, uh, I was guessing if sometimes uh, the, 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 the narration of uh, a good relationship between uh, technology and religion can be a mythical structure finding to compensate or to, to find a compromise between science and uh, religion, because telling directly the story of science and religion would be too conflictual in certain uh, cases. But going on, and we have said that digital technology can be seen as an anti sender could be seen uh, as an anti sender and there's another concept uh, uh, that is the anti-subject that uh, in narratology would be the antagonist. So what could be the role of, a di of digital technology as an anti-subject, as an antagonist? And reading, I, I read some time ago, uh, an article, a very interesting one, uh, about the introduction of digital technology in Amish communities. And there was, uh, there was a, a sentence uh, that was very interesting because they, they said that um, communities are, are debating about uh, the, the need of introducing also for business uh, digital and mobile technology in their, uh, in their villages, but uh, someone uh, sees, them, uh, sees them as a threat towards the community soundness. And in this case, it seems to me that the storytelling is about a community willing to preserve its soundness and an external enemy, the digital technology, aiming to something incompatible with its solidity. So it's a typical structure where we see a subject, a hero, and an anti-hero. But in this case, the hero is not the individual, but the community. And this is interesting because 
The conflict between, between an, a, a hero and an anti-hero is along an axis that is the axis of the action, while the conflict between the sender and the anti-sender is along an axis that is an axis that we call of the manipulation, that is a cognitive action, that uh, persuade uh, the hero and so on. And uh, while in the first narration, the narration in which the technology is the anti-sender opposed to religion, uh, they struggle, they fight uh, uh, for the influence, for the persuasion of a subject that is the, the individual. And this leaves uh, the individual, uh, this let the individual keep his free will because it's up to the individual to decide if to adhere to the sender mission or the anti-sender's mission. And the second narrative, that is an alternative one, we have the direct fight between the technology and the community, and the role of the individual is lost. The individual is only a mechanism that has to respond to uh, the hero or to the anti-hero, and, and so there's no, no space for uh, the, um, the free will. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, and both this, uh, the interesting thing is that both this narration uh, take place in situations such as the one of the Amish, and the way in which we uh, tell them is also influence the way in which the real debate and the real decision process uh, will take place. So there would be also other uh, other things that I would like to say about the opponent, about the object, uh, the, the the negative value of the object as a, uh, as a, um, as a, uh, the, the technology as a negative object. For example, in the um, in that article about the Amish, there's another sentence, very interesting one, that says they do not want to introduce mobile phones because they and internet in general because they think that uh, they can foster personal pleasure and weaken the character. And in this case, the narration is pretty different because it means that the technology is, called, uh, is considered not as a sender, some, something acting, but as an, but an, as an object. Object, a negative one, uh, such as the the one of the Lord, uh, the ring in the Lord of the Ring. But uh, uh, I, I don't want to go further because <laughs> it's late. So these are only final uh, final uh, proposals that I uh, that I would like to share with Massimo and the, and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piero. Our third uh, discussant is Alessandra Vitullo. She is a researcher of sociology of religion at Sapienza University. And well, she, re she re recently published a monograph on the digitalization of religious practices and emergence of what she has called as, as online sacred space. I'm the only sociologist at this panel, so I have a big responsibility. It's kind of tricky for me to have this uh, discussion with other semiologists. So while I was reading the paper of Massimo Leone, something came up to my mind that reminded me one of my first readings about digital religion and how semiotics can be a source for interpreting and understanding the presence of religious practices online. Actually, since the beginning, the World Wide Web was born as a text, as an hypertext markup language. And the textual analysis was one of the first and essential tools for scholars to study what religious community were doing online. This recalled me a very interesting chapter titled Reading and Praying Online, published by Young Glenn in the famous, one of the first famous book about digital religion, that is Religion Online, edited by Dawson and Cohen. So I would have the pleasure to discuss with you this interpretation and readaptation of uh, Young Glenn of the Austin Performative Act. Uh, 
Uh, in this chapter, Young analyzed the different presence of online religion and religion line, focusing on a special non-denominational Christian church called Church for All. The churchforall.org website offers visitors the opportunity to become members of this online church. Doing so requires that the visitor to the website simply agree with the statement of faith, Jesus Christ is Lord and God. Once the visitor has agreed with this statement, he is invited to enter uh, his email and address on a click join noun button. Because the Church for All exists solely in the cyberspace, the primary significance of becoming of a member seems to lie in one's agreement with the statement of faith. Encapsulated in this statement of gesture by visitor to this website are both information in the form of doctrinal proposition and participation in the form of one's assent to the truth of the statement. What Young proposed is that one way, one way of interpreting this conjoining of information of interpretation is with the Austin concept of performative utterance, in which a person is doing something rather than merely saying something. Initially, Austin contrasts performative with statements. While statements are either true or false based upon their correspondence with the objective facts, Performative are either felicitous or infelicitous according to their efficacy in performing the action to which they are linked. Ultimately, however, Hosting claims that the distinction between statement and performatives is neither final or nor complete, he concludes that when a person makes a statement, she is in fact performing an act. When one visits the Church for All website and decides to become a member by agreeing with the statement proclaiming Jesus, Lordship and Divinity, both a statement and a performative utterance are taking place. A person making this statement is not only asserting its truth in some abstract or intellectual way, he's also doing something in the sense of declaring his religious faith and in the process of joining this online church. At the same time, there is an informational aspect to this statement. It would, we can be assumed, the point, to be pointless to make a such declaration if one did not also hold the substance of that declaration to be true and in correspondence with the fact of human existence. Austin's conception highlights the way in which language acts both as an instrument of human agency and the means by which one maps reality. Hence, the ascent to a statement of a Christian faith involves one in dynamic of both truth, claim, and participatory performance. The concept of the perform performative utterance helps explain how a simple statement of belief and the agreement with this statement through just the click of a mouse button are both an exercise of information provision and the reception as well as a participation in what is ultimately an act of Christian faith. The reading of young perspective in combination with that of Massimo Leone helps us as sociologists of religion to use new tools for overcoming the absence of the materiality of the bodies and of the object in the study of religion online by using other cognitive experience and parameters connected to the language this suggestion has become quite clear to me during the pandemic period, which stressed how the communities, practices, and digital language were in a forced, but also in an inseparable relationship. To better understand this concept, I would like to propose like a common complementary reverse version of your application of Gramas Act and Grammar to point out how the search for religiosity, spirituality, was an helper, opponent, sender, and receiver for the use of digital technology during the lockdown. Just some example, starting from the helper. During COVID-19, religion sometimes intervened as a tool, as an infrastructure, or as an element that facilitated the mediation with digital technology. How? People who were isolated at home have been assisted by their priests, pastors, imams, rabbis, and other religious staff to be connected and participate in their religious practices, community, and life. 
in watching streaming services, reading online Bible, writing Facebook prayer, the religious institution personnel was an essential helper for some believer to develop digital skills and abilities which were previously absent, but turned out to be indispensable during the lockdown to continue the personal religious practices. Religious as an opponent. At the same time, religion can be an opponent or an obstacle to development of these digital skills. During the pandemic, numerous religious institutions, especially the more conservative ones, thought that the digital technology could turn away the believer from the real, true, original religious experience. During the pandemic, this was the standpoint of many conservative evangelical groups in the US to promote their anti-lockdown positions. Or thinking out of the pandemic, another example is the internet ban proclaimed by the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in 1999 or an association of a conservative Protestant, the Spiritual Counterfeit Project, that in 1997 published three volumes encouraging to dismiss the use of internet because it was again the values of the Bible. Religion as a sender can trigger the action imparting to the subject the desire or the obligation to use digital technology. Looking always at the pandemic period, the need for believers to maintain the link with the religious community and to looking for religious support has led to the use of unknown technology and internet platform, expanding the range of skills and digital competence owned by the community members. Religion as a receiver. As Massimo said, said digital technology can also find expression in the moment of sanction. That is the moment in which a narrative instance must determine whatever or not the main action of the narrative flow has been accomplished. So during the pandemic, religion as a receiver or as a moment of suction has sort two kinds of effect. Enhancing and endorsing the use of digital technology for the expansion of our religious experience or on the contrary, provoking the rejection of the use of digital technology because they are perceived as a fake or disturbing dimension for religious life. Then we can have religion as a subject. In this narrative, religion as a subject is represented not only by the divinity, but also by all these religious actors which are involved in this process of mediation with the use of technology. Or as, a, or as an object. It's easier to imagine religion as an object intended as the attainment of the faith and of the transcendence through practice of devotion, mediated also by the use of digital technology. Rephrasing Massimo Leone words, this dimension in which human subjects consider themselves spiritually and existentially fulfilled only when they find themselves in the perfect conjunction with godness and the transcendence, with the digital twin of paradise. In concluding this flipped version of uh, Massimo Leone readaptation of the Gramas Act and Grammar, I want to just outline for us as a sociologist that digital religion scholarship open up new challenges to the traditional studies of the religious phenomenon. Challenges which require sociologists to use brand new interdisciplinary model as this panel show and to frame new analysis, forcing us to explore new areas of knowledge that had never be been addressed before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra. And so our presentations uh, are, are done. And maybe now we have just a little bit of time of Q&A. Um, so I want to ask to our main presenter if it is OK for, for you, Massimo, to maybe check if there are questions in, uh, among the, the audience or online. And at the end, you can give a reply to almost everybody. <laughs> OK, so do we have questions in, in, in here? Anybody? who wants to ask a question. I leave some time to think. In the meantime, I ask if there are questions online, maybe someone at home who wants to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, raise your, raise your hand. Otherwise, yes. oh, we have a question, please. Come uh, to, to the mic.
Um, it's a general question for all of you. Um, in your studies, uh, have you come across or are you studying cases that are not Western and or Christian, um, or whether new religious movement, but in the West, but elsewhere in the world, uh, especially in Asia where technology has developed so much? Thank you. Thank you for, for this question. Any other question? Maybe we can collect one more if there actually is. Otherwise, I will let uh, Professor Leone to give uh, some replies. Well, uh, I should. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that I I, I feel extremely um, grateful and uh, and humbled. Um, because of all the uh, <clears throat> wonderful insights that I've um, received and that I've uh, taken as uh, um, as many glasses of fresh water <laughs> at the end of a of a long evening and after a talk, so they were all refreshing and they were all important, and they they made me think and enlarge my perspectives. So thank you very much. Um, starting perhaps uh, from the last question, it is a very good question, of course. Um, there is, I believe, also in the field of the study of the relations between um, religion, religions, religiosity, the sacred, and um, technology, in particular digital technology, and now more and more artificial intelligence, a certain focus and concentration on those um, areas in cultures uh, of the world in which uh, uh, most of these technologies are being created and are massively being used and set parameters that uh, in many cases become global parameters. Uh, there are of course very important exceptions, you know, if you think um, of a social network like TikTok is a uh, Chinese made uh, uh, social network that uh, has been much faster than Facebook in becoming extremely global, you know, reaching 1 billion users in uh, just five years, you know, against the um, eight years to reach the same amount of users of, um, of Facebook. So, um, at the same time, uh, many of these platforms, software, technologies, digital tools that are a, um, shaped, uh, elaborated, uh, developed worldwide, follow a certain global pattern that can become also global in certain circumstances. And it becomes global, I believe, especially when it is particularly embodied. Um, that is the case of robotics, for instance. Uh, in the case of robotics, I think there is a very strong incidence of, um, let's say, ideologies of meaning, um, ideologies of relation, uh, the relation between the human being and the other beings. And um, it is a, a very uh, frequented object of investigation, the idea that uh, we should develop a sort of a competitive study of the relation of human beings with robots, because these relations are actually influenced by deep-seated ideologies of meaning in which religion plays an important role. Think about the um, particular status that robots have in the current uh, Japanese culture, for instance, and uh, um, how this role is still, despite the globalization of robotics and uh, android, uh, anthropomorphic robotics, is still incomparable to the same um, uh, relation uh, in uh, uh, other areas of the world. So <clears throat> there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, both in terms of using uh, digital technology and artificial intelligence to study uh, different religions and religious traditions have 
just hinted at the possibility of studying a non-Christian corpus of texts through um, computational linguistics, but this is still a minority example. So the majority of efforts and also accomplishments um, have been a reached in relation to, to Christianity. But there is also the other dimension that I was evoking of trying to understand how uh, and in which different ways these new uh, digital technologies and especially artificial intelligence are received by cultures and societies also because of the influence of a certain uh, religious tradition. Um, my colleagues who specialize on the reception of artificial intelligence in Judaism, for, in, for instance, tell me that the relation with the idea of creating um, another sentient being has a different tradition in Judaism. And of course, there is the <laughs> famous reference to the golem, but it's not only that. So it, 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 it is an example of how, depending on the religious um, setting, um, even in, let's say, the so-called um, secular, post-secular societies, um, these particular ideologies of meaning can have an, an impact in the way in which um, particularly sensitive uh, technologies like artificial intelligence are used, are received, um, are interpreted, are attributed meaning. So uh, it, it is not really an answer, but uh, it is a question to the question in a way that uh, it was very good because it points to a need of the of the field. And um, as I was saying before, I, I completely take all the insights that were were offered. Um, certainly. Um, uh, from uh, Paolo, Professor uh, Peverini, um, I, I take this idea that uh, we should indeed uh, uh, study also the, let's say, meta texts or programmatic texts um, or texts of orientation that are produced by religious community in order to interpret new uh, technologies. And, um, and some of them are particularly enlightening. Um, I, for instance, uh, cannot, uh, of course, go into the details of your very rich uh, proposal, but I uh, consider that uh, what you pointed out in relation to this warning by Pope Francis, the fact that the um, caveat uh, should go to these um, uh, impossibility or extreme difficulty of foreseeing the effects uh, of artificial intelligence, which are not only the ethical effects, you know, the text that you quoted was very technical, you know, the, <laughs> the author was very well advised, because uh, it, what, what is really problematic is the relation between the inputs and the outputs, the so-called black box of artificial intelligence, the fact that the results that we get from artificial intelligence on the basis of some inputs cannot, cannot be reverse engineered. Uh, they are somehow mysterious because they are the product of extremely complex equations uh, whose results, of course, can be calculated, but calculating them would require an enormous computational uh, capacity. So, in a way, we cannot really determine uh, what the um, results and outputs of an artificial intelligence are. And this is what really makes the difference in relation to previous technologies, this undecidability and the suitability of artificial intelligence. And correctly, that was uh, pointed out uh, in relation to this uh, very good neologism of uh, algorithmics, you know, the ethics, which is not simply the ethics of technology, not simply the ethics of digital technology, is the ethics of some uh, systems that are reaching such a complexity that are actually um, prompting some very new and unprecedented ethical questions. 
But in relation to these ethical questions, in having some solid ground is um, perhaps important. It is important to have data. It is important to have a very in-depth, thick uh, contextualization. Uh, the work uh, of sociologists, of uh, anthropologists, of uh, n-ethnologists uh, uh, is fundamental. But it is also fundamental to uh, try to have a general theory of what is happening to many in the religious field um, as a consequence of this massive technological development. And this is uh, something that uh, Pierre, Professor Polidoro really um, pointed out with this uh, capacity of his of a starting from a kernel uh, of a system of interpretation that I proposed in my paper and to uh, develop it uh, much more uh, exhaustively and extensively. And that is the point of having a system of interpretation. It is intersubjectivity. It is the possibility of having uh, scholars either simultaneously or in a tradition working on such a complex uh, field and somehow complexifying this greed of reading and uh, making the meshes of this greed uh, thinner and thinner and capable of uh, uh, seizing the nuances of, uh, of this phenomenon. So uh, this, uh, in a way, also combinatorial process that you proposed, it is extremely enriching and uh, I completely see the possibilities of interpretation that you proposed exactly because somehow you played with the same game and so I can see where the gaps are to be filled were in my interpretation and how you filled them, you know, and uh, of course there are many more to be filled, you know, and to be filled through further a uh, complexification. And then, uh, well, the final um, uh, proposal was particularly um, uh, a, a fruitful, uh, exactly because it comes from a, a different disciplinary perspective, but at the same time, from an, an effort to be in dialogue with the semiotics or, or other disciplines of meaning. And the way you refer to Austin and to this um, performative, pragmatic uh, meaning of the, let's say, a telematic gesture, you know, the click, um, is to me fundamental because it shows that we have to rethink the ways in which uh, these communities of meaning are created in a world that, of course, is not completely disembodied, but it is embodied in a different way in which new utterances appear and create meaning and create community and create also conflict sometimes, as it has been pointed out by the other commentators in new ways. Um, so uh, it is absolutely fundamental to go uh, in depth in this context, to study them, to accumulate data, to uh, participate as well um, in the um, religious life uh, of uh, communities that have been touched by new technologies and propose interpretations also because um, perhaps uh, the most important thing in the relation between religion and uh, these new digital technologies uh, uh, still has to be said, because it is true, as I think Paolo was saying, that there is something disquieting, there is something marvelous in these new technologies, but to distinguish, to discern, <laughs> a verb that I think Paolo likes very much, between the disquieting, the awful and the wonderful, we, we need all our disciplines, our human knowledge, and perhaps uh, also a little bit of inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the attention. And thanks to all the presenters for being here and presenting such smart, interesting papers and interventions. So, Professor Cipriani, I think the day of work is over. Thank you, Mr. Quinn.